Hello there. Glad you're with me again. I welcome you to this day number 348. Today we read Micah 7, the last few verses of Isaiah 52, before we read the famous chapter Isaiah 53, and then Revelation 5. Let's turn to Micah 7. The complete quote about the Messiah's birthplace in Micah 5, quoted to Herod in Matthew 2.6, mentions Bethlehem, a woman in labor giving birth, and the Lord is pictured as our shepherd, who will be highly honored around the world. Note that Herod would have had cause for concern about his reign if such a leader appeared. If Micah 6 8 sounded familiar, it is because Micah quoted from Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. Micah 7. Heading Israel's Moral Corruption. Micah speaks It's hopeless. I'm like a hungry person who finds no fruit left on the trees and no grapes on the vines. All the grapes and all the tasty figs have been picked. There is not an honest person left in the land, no one loyal to God. Everyone is waiting for a chance to commit murder. Everyone hunts down their own people. They are all experts at doing evil. Officials and judges ask for bribes. The influential people tell them what they want, and so they scheme together. Even the best and most honest of them are worthless as weeds. The day has come when God will punish the people, as he warned them through their watchmen, the prophets. Now they are in confusion. Don't believe your neighbor or trust your friend. Be careful what you say even to your husband or wife. In these times, sons treat their fathers like fools, daughters oppose their mothers, and young women quarrel with their mothers-in-law. Your enemies are the members of your own family. But I will wait confidently for God who will save me. My God will hear me. Heading, The Lord Brings Salvation Our enemies have no reason to gloat over us. We have fallen, but we will rise again. We are in darkness now, but the Lord will give us light. We have sinned against the Lord, so now we must endure his anger for a while. But in the end he will defend us and right the wrongs that have been done to us. He will bring us out to the light, We will live to see him save us. Then our enemies will see this and be disgraced. The same enemies who taunted us by asking, Where is the Lord your God? We will see them defeated, trampled down like mud in the streets. People of Jerusalem, the time to rebuild the city walls is coming. At that time, your territory will be enlarged. Your people will return to you from everywhere, from Assyria in the east, from Egypt in the south, from the region of the Euphrates River, from distant seas and far-off mountains. But the earth will become a desert because of the wickedness of those who live on it. Heading The Lord's Compassion on Israel Micah speaks Be a shepherd to your people, Lord, the people you have chosen. Although they live apart in the wilderness, there is fertile land around them. Let them go and feed in the rich pastures of Bashan and Gilead as they did long ago. Work miracles for us, Lord, as you did in the days when you brought us out of Egypt. The nations will see this and be frustrated in spite of all their strength. 
In dismay, they will close their mouths and cover their ears. They will crawl in the dust like snakes. They will come from their fortresses, trembling and afraid. They will turn in fear to the Lord our God. There is no other God like you, O Lord. You forgive the sins of your people who have survived. You do not stay angry forever, but you take pleasure in showing us your constant love. You will be merciful to us once again. You will trample our sins underfoot and send them to the bottom of the sea. You will show your faithfulness and constant love to your people, the descendants of Abraham and of Jacob, as you promised our ancestors long ago. Let's turn to Isaiah 52, where we'll start at verse 13. In our reading yesterday in chapter 52, we heard the passage that Paul quoted in Romans 10. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news, the good news of peace and salvation, the news that the God of Israel reigns. All the ends of the earth will see the victory of our God. Note that God gave a special message in Isaiah 52, 11, and 12 to those who would carry the temple treasures back to Jerusalem led by Ezra, Ezra chapter 8. Those who carried those sacred objects and who prayed and fasted with Ezra beside the river near Babylon had their prayer answered around 200 years before they prayed it. Isaiah 52, starting at verse 13. The Lord says, My servant will succeed in his task. He will be highly honored. Many people were shocked when they saw him. He was so disfigured that he hardly looked human. But now many nations will marvel at him and kings will be speechless with amazement. They will see and understand something they had never known. Isaiah 53 The people reply, Who would have believed what we now report? Who could have seen the Lord's hand in this? It was the will of the Lord that his servant grow like a plant taking root in dry ground. He had no dignity or beauty to make us take notice of him. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing that would draw us to him. We despised him and rejected him. He endured suffering and pain. No one would even look at him. We ignored him as if he were nothing. But he endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne. All the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. But because of our sins, he was wounded, beaten, because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. He was treated harshly, but endured it humbly. He never said a word. Like a lamb about to be slaughtered, like a sheep about to be sheared, he never said a word. He was arrested and sentenced and led off to die, and no one cared about his fate. He was put to death for the sins of our people. 
He was placed in a grave with those who are evil. He was buried with the rich, even though he had never committed a crime or ever told a lie. The Lord says, It was my will that he should suffer. His death was a sacrifice to bring forgiveness. And so he will see his descendants. He will live a long life, and through him my purpose will succeed. After a life of suffering, he will again have joy. He will know that he did not suffer in vain. My devoted servant, with whom I am pleased, will bear the punishment of many, and for his sake I will forgive them. And so I will give him a place of honor, a place among the great and powerful. He willingly gave his life and shared the fate of evil men. He took the place of many sinners and prayed that they might be forgiven. Let's turn now to Revelation 5. After acting as Jesus' secretary to write down the seven letters to the seven churches, John was taken up to God's throne in heaven. We can note a feature of Jewish custom in the writing of John in Revelation 4. In reverence, he avoided saying, I saw God sitting on his throne. He went beyond custom and didn't even say, The Lord or Kyrios. Instead, he said, Someone or the one sitting on the throne. God was mentioned directly only in the quotes of the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders. Note that we have seen the living creatures with four faces before in Ezekiel. And in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. We are told this is the sevenfold Spirit of God. The number seven has a symbolic meaning indicating perfection, completeness, or attributes of God. There are verses to compare in the episode notes. Commentators also say that John could have thought about Isaiah 11, 2 through 5, where Isaiah prophesied about the sevenfold spiritual characteristics of the branch growing from David's stump. That is, of course, Jesus. Revelation 5 I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. It was covered with writing on both sides and was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel who announced in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But there was no one in heaven or on earth or in the world below who could open the scroll and look inside it. I cried bitterly because no one could be found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside it. Then one of the elders said to me, Don't cry. Look, the lion from Judah's tribe, the great descendant of David, has won the victory and he can break the seven seals and open the scroll. Then I saw a lamb standing in the center of the throne, surrounded by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb appeared to have been killed. It had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God that have been sent through the whole earth. The Lamb went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. As he did so, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each had a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. They sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to break open its seals, for you were killed, and by your sacrificial death you bought for God 
people from every tribe, language, nation, and race. You have made them a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they shall rule on earth. Again I looked, and I heard angels, thousands and millions of them, They stood around the throne, the four living creatures and the elders, and sang in a loud voice, The Lamb who was killed is worthy to receive power, wealth, wisdom, and strength, honor, glory, and praise. And I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, and in the world below, and in the sea, all living beings in the universe, and they were singing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor, glory and might forever and ever. The four living creatures answered, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Please join me in prayer. Our Lord Christ Jesus, How can we begin to praise you for what we've read today? There is no one like you, O Lord. You have trampled our sins underfoot and sent them to the bottom of the sea. You have fulfilled all the promises given from ancient days to Abraham and Jacob. People from all nations and ethnic groups should be silent with amazement. Kings and the wise of this world should marvel because of understanding what you have done. Instead, however, so many continue to take no notice of you and find nothing attractive in you. We are such wayward sheep. Let it sink deep into our hearts, Lord, that the wounds and beatings that should have fallen on me and my listener fell on you instead. Thank you, and thank you again, for taking our punishment. May we learn from your humility, and may we see you in your victory. You are indeed the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the victorious Lamb of God. We praise you that 700 years before you were born, our Father God revealed his plans to Isaiah about your suffering and your victory. You are worthy to receive power, wealth, wisdom, strength, glory, and praise. 